We're going to hear from the first of our Bible readings this morning, Matthew 27, 1 to 10. Thanks, Mark. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Jesus, Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. <clears throat> That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took 30 pieces of silver the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field, as the Lord commanded. Verse 11 of Matthew 27. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was, was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, don't have anything to do with that innocent man for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuade the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor? Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with, Messiah, with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged, and handed him over to be crucified. That is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Russell. Matthew 27, verses 27 to 44. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then they twisted together a crown of thorns and sat it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail! King of the Jews, they said. 
They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Thanks, Russell. We're going to continue to worship God in song. We're going to sing a wonderful reflection. Reading from Matthew 27, verses 45 to 61. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all of the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Sabathani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine, vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who, had, who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Graham. Let me pray before we consider these events that we've just been hearing about. Lord God, today we come before you humbly, Lord, aware of exactly what you went through on that day as we've heard it read. 
Lord, we thank you that this has been retained for us. And Lord, I pray now as we consider these amazing words that you would work in our heart by the power of your Holy Spirit for our encouragement and our growth. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we've heard the account of Jesus' death as it's told by Matthew. And the big question that, of course, is asked about Jesus' death is why did Jesus die? Here's a prominent young leader, charismatic speaker, miracle worker, compassionate man to the crowds, falsely accused by the authorities, pronounced guilty in some kind of sham trial. Now he's been tortured and executed for no clear, obvious crime. And yet, as much as this is a tragedy, the clarity of the Bible is this was no accident. This was no mistake. This was part of God's plan. In fact, it was always part of God's plan. Why did Jesus die? Well, the Bible addresses this in many places. Here are two examples that I find helpful. Romans 5.8 and 1 Corinthians 15.3, later writings of one of Jesus' followers reflecting on Jesus' death. The Apostle Paul writes, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And another place, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Just from these two sentences, we see Christ died for sins and Christ died for sinners. What does this mean? Well, firstly, what are sins? Sins are things that we do that are out of line with God's plan. But more than that, sin is something deeper. Sin is a state of the human heart, a heart that turns away from its creator, a heart that instead worships itself or, or anything else, a state of the heart pointed away from God that leads to ignoring and rejecting God in things we do and say and think. Maybe more important than what are sins, who are sinners? Or more specifically perhaps here, which sinners did Jesus die for? And I think perhaps the most personal question of all, could Jesus have died for my sins? Could he have died for my sins? In today's reading, Jesus is obviously the main character. He's the one that the action follows. But there are a host of other characters who, as becomes very apparent when you read the accounts, like us all, are sinners. They are people who, in all sorts of ways, large or small, reject God and live for themselves. And so I want to consider these characters very briefly. And as we do, I want to consider, did Jesus die for them? Did Jesus die for these kinds of sinners? The first character we meet is Judas, one of Jesus' closest friends. Judas, we see, betrayed Jesus to death for money. And, and here in Matthew 27, the first reading, we see he's overcome with regret. Despair takes over Judas and eventually he kills himself. But Judas has betrayed Jesus. Do we ever betray Jesus? I know I do. I betray Jesus when I don't stand up for Jesus in conversation. When I hear Jesus' name being trashed and I stay silent. Please hear this news today. Jesus died for sins of betrayal. Jesus died for betrayers just like me. In the very same passage, we read about the chief priests and elders Judas here, he's really just a pawn in their schemes. They're the real causes of Jesus' death. They're the puppet masters here, or so it seems. And they've already done a lot before this chapter, but they appear throughout our readings today. Although in their first interaction with Judas, they show this pretense of respectability regarding the blood money of Judas, the money they gave him to hand Jesus over to them. Probably they're doing this to ease their conscience, sort of keep up appearances, I suspect, claiming there's, you know, there's limited things we can do with blood money. We need to keep our hands clean. Essentially, it's hypocrisy. The chief priests act with hypocrisy and this pretense of respectability. Do we ever show a pretense of respectability like this? 
I know I do. When I come to church on Sunday, perhaps, despite grudges or seething anger or self-righteousness in my heart. I know I do when I make comments that sound holy, but my heart is a long way from this godly attitude. I know I do when I set my own standards of behaviour, regardless of what Jesus calls me to. I wonder if you can see this tendency to hypocrisy and false respectability in your own life as well. But let me say this very clearly. Jesus died for sins of hypocrisy. Jesus died for hypocrites just like me. A moment later, Jesus is in a trial in front of Pilate, the Roman governor. It's a fascinating scene, and very quickly the character of this man Pilate becomes clear. He knows, it says it, he knows the chief priests and elders have arrested Jesus out of self-interest. He knows Jesus is innocent, committed no crime, but he still caves in, doesn't he, to their request. He caves in to the stirred-up crowd. He gives up Jesus to be executed. It's a horrible example of abuse of power and miscarriage of justice. And yet, just at the end, he tries to excuse himself. He brings out a bowl, he washes his hands in front of everyone, saying, this isn't on me. I'm washing my hands of this. As a leader, Pilate is weak and he's easily swayed. Pilate acts with cowardice and injustice. I wonder if we ever act cowardly like Pilate does. I know I do when I allow myself to be pressured into doing or saying something that deep down I know is wrong. I know I do when I try to shift blame like Pilate as he washes his hands, trying to rid myself of responsibility. I wonder if you ever see that tendency to, to cowardice or blame shifting in your own life. Let me assure you, Jesus died for sins of cowardice and blame shifting. Jesus died for cowards just like me. Well, the trial finishes and Jesus is put into the hands of the soldiers. We don't get a lot of insight into their feelings and their concerns. It seems like Jesus now is just, he's just in the cog of the machine, the Roman killing machine, the whipping, the mocking, and then the crucifixion itself. Perhaps most tellingly, I think, the soldiers gambling over Jesus' clothes as he, as he hangs there dying. And you think, well, sure, they're, they're just doing their job. But what seems clear is that they are numb. They are disengaged. They are insensitive to Jesus' pain on full display. I wonder if our lack of insight into their feelings is actually telling. None are shown. None are recorded. Instead of sitting there aghast and exhausted at this other man they've just been forced to execute, they maintain their insensitivity, trying to score some new clothes from the dying man. These soldiers act with callous insensitivity. I wonder if this is something we ever do acting with callous insensitivity like the soldiers. I know I do this sometimes. When I hear about someone's grief and pain and I don't allow it to affect me, maybe in the name of self-preservation, or when I seek to numb my response to real pain with, with entertainment or diversion, I wonder if you see this ten tendency to insensitivity in your own life too. Let me assure you, Jesus died for sins of insensitivity and callousness. Jesus died for callous ones like me. Jesus is there dying, and more characters now come into view while he's on the cross. A host of people are introduced by Matthew who call out things to Jesus. The other criminals executed next to him. The chief priests and elders, they've come back. And there's also general passers-by, general population. It's time for some cheap shots. You know, at that pretender Jesus, the one who made those bold claims about destroying and rebuilding the temple, the one who claimed to be the son of God. It's kind of easy pickings, isn't it? Pretty low-hanging fruit. Jesus is just dying there. He's got no zinger comebacks anymore like he did back when they were debating in the temples. He can't turn the table on these encounters and, and, and reveal the guilt of his opponents. No, he's helpless. He can barely breathe. These passers-by, they're, they're armchair critics, aren't they? They're comfortable in their freedom as they walk happily down the path, taking pot shots from a very safe distance to the man dying. They insult and they are dismissive. Do we ever insult and critique 
from a position of safety like these people? I know I do. I know I do. When I join the crowd in heaping shame and blame in my head on those who are easy targets, national leaders, public figures, sometimes even public Christians. When I make snide comments or insult even people I know and love because I'm just in a position of comfort and ease. I wonder if you ever see this tendency to insult and criticism in your own life. Today we need to be reminded Jesus died for sins of insult and comfortable criticism. Jesus died for comfortable critics just like me. I don't know if you resonate with any of these characters. Maybe, maybe not. There's one other character who had a very unique role on that Friday, and that's Barabbas. A criminal of some sort, probably a rebel, maybe a local rogue, captured by the Romans for troublemaking. And the word Barabbas literally means son of the father or, or son of his father. It's almost like the definition of a generic name. He's, he's his father's son. That's who he is. And we see what happens. In accordance with a local custom, the Romans would free one Jewish prisoner at Passover for the people. Pilate gives the people that choice between Jesus of Nazareth, who they've just arrested, or Barabbas. We read the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. And a couple of verses later, then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. At the very heart of the gospel, at the heart of what happened on Friday, at the heart of this idea of Jesus dying for us is substitution. That Jesus dies in our place. In our place. Because of our wayward hearts, because of our sin, because of all those different things that we've already seen in this passage, God's right verdict on us is guilty. But Jesus himself takes our sin and so bears God's guilty verdict. Jesus dies in our place and we go free. And there's perhaps no clearer example of this than Barabbas. This this man, this generic man, this generic human person, the one who is quite rightly condemned and guilty and yet it's on Good Friday in a very real way that Jesus takes his place and Barabbas goes free. So today we remember, today I remember, I am like Barabbas. I am a generic general person but I am considered guilty in God's eyes, rightly so. I deserve God's punishment. And yet on Good Friday, I remember, I am like Barabbas. I am like Barabbas. I am one who is condemned to die, and yet I am one for whom Jesus has taken my place. And so just like Barabbas, today I go free. It's a bit heavy, I understand, considering all these negative examples and just reflecting on maybe these characteristics in our own lives. It's sometimes it's like holding up a mirror and seeing the hardest, darkest parts of ourselves. Well, Matthew 27 finishes with three other characters. Matthew really just jams them in, doesn't he? But these three last characters are different. These are examples of faith. And like most examples, they're very real. We see a Roman centurion who sees the incredible signs surrounding Jesus' death and cries out, Surely this was the Son of God. We meet the women who follow Jesus, who witnessed the crucifixion, faithfully standing watch and observe the burial, seeing where the body was laid. And we meet Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy follower of Jesus who approaches Pilate for the body and buries it with love and care in his own tomb. Please be clear, these aren't bold heroes, are they? Nobody's rushing up to the cross to save Jesus. Nobody's giving their life in his place. But what we do see is faith. A simple faith in Jesus, a recognition of who he is despite everything, a commitment to faithfully follow even in the darkest hour. The wonderful thing about Jesus' death for our sake is how little we are called to do to receive the benefit. We don't have to be heroes. 
We don't have to even meet Jesus halfway. Jesus simply calls us to have faith, to trust in him, to trust in what his death has achieved for us. I've asked so far whether we see characteristics of ourselves in the various characters in this chapter who demonstrate that range of human sins that Jesus dies for. The last question is, do you have faith? Do you trust in this death of Jesus for your sake? Do you bow your knee at the cross of Jesus and with the centurion say, surely this was the Son of God? Let me pray. Lord God, today we are humble as we see through the gospel account of Matthew all these different examples of people who let you down, people who sinned, people who betrayed you in different ways. And Lord, as we see them, it's like looking into a mirror. We see these tendencies in ourselves in, in different ways, in small ways. But Lord, we know just like them, we also are sinners. And yet, Lord, we are so grateful for your death on the cross that just like it was for Barabbas, your death means we, the guilty one, go free. So, Lord, we pray today that you would increase our faith. You would help us to trust in your death for us. Lord, to cling to it because that's all we've got. And Lord, thank you that that is all you ask for, that we would have faith and trust in what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing one final song today. And this is a 